there wasn't going to be, I thought anyway, Senate change in my lifetime, and thus uh, my Senate days came to an end. And so the last one that I mentioned, I've mentioned the two, Mr. Harper's proposals on change in the most recent by Mr. Trudeau, and we now await the Supreme Court in terms of what's the next step. So even though there's been great dissatisfaction and with the current Senate, I think the biggest problem is there's no consensus on what to do about it. I think if you took a poll, a great number of the people would say, yes, we have to have change. But then you start to break it down and someone will say, well, well we should abolish it. And others say, well, it should be elected. And some say it should be equal. And it, it goes on and on and on as to how are we going to get a consensus. And can you imagine if the, if the Supreme Court says seven provinces, 50% of the population, that's the easiest one. Can you imagine getting seven premiers that would agree just on that? With their legislatures agreeing, the House of Commons would have to agree, and the Senate would have to agree. So think that through. Each of the premiers that's in agreement is going to say, we are going to strengthen the regional representation from our area, which is going to take away power from me as premier, right? Because right now, the premiers are viewed in many ways as being regional representation, representatives. So the premiers might not be too inclined. And in fact, recently, when this has been discussed, uh, the premier of, I think it was Prince Edward Island, said, well, if we were to be in agreement, we would want to have some other compromises. And then you start to get back into the beach and the charlatan. And that's a slippery slope in its own right. But then you say, would the House of Commons agree to that? Well, the House of Commons, would, that, would they be really excited about having another chamber that would be now more powerful? Not more powerful in terms of constitutional power, but more powerful in terms of being more accepted because they'd be elected. Right now, the Senate has one of the biggest limitations on its power, constitutional power, is that they know that they're appointed and they don't represent the elected will of the people. And so how can they say no to the elected will on the House of Commons side when they're appointed? But if they were elected, they would have greater power in terms of counterbalancing the House of Commons. And I'm not sure the House of Commons would care for that as well. So then what about the Senate? Would the, the existing Senate agree to change so that they are no longer in their jobs? I see some nods going this way. I don't think they would, would they? So, what are our chances of 750? What are our chances of unanimous, which would be even more difficult? So, I wait with bated breath in terms of see what the, what the uh, Supreme Court will say. So, if that is the difficulty of getting Senate change, Senate reform, is there any hope? And for now, it looks as if it's going to be very, very difficult to get any of those scenarios that I've outlined. And that leads us back to the status quo of where we're at at the moment. Now, I make an argument that there's one more option. I make the argument that it wouldn't require constitutional change at all. And it's an interesting proposal that I've been making to the media. The media, as perhaps you know, maybe to your board of I have been interviewing me a lot about the Senate recently. Every time there's a new twist, they get a hold of me to see what my thoughts are on it. And I keep saying there is one other option, and, and they ignore it. So this last time, and it was global, they said, we want an opinion from you on this. And I said, no, I'm not going to give you one. How come? I said, because I have a proposal for Senate change, and you just keep ignoring it. No, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll include it. What is it? OK, I'll do the interview. And here's what I'm proposing. This is just, just me. In the Senate right now, the policies on what claims can be made on expenses, travel, residence, interpretation of the law, interpretation of the Constitution, a lot of that is done by a committee called the Committee of Internal Economy, made up of senators. And they were making those decisions when I was there as clerk, and they still are today. And I was very, very frustrated with them because they would establish a policy. My role was then to implement the policy. And so 
right? You're a senator and you say, what is the policy? And the committee says, okay, this is the policy and you go ahead and do it. But Michael, another senator comes along and he goes to the internal economy and he says, the clerk is being really ma nasty to me and making, I have to follow that rule. Oh, Senator, you don't have to follow that rule. Here's another interpretation. And I think that's been getting them into a whole bunch of trouble and I wish they wouldn't do it. Because you can't have a set of rules that are interpreted one way one day, as Senator Wallen has been arguing, and whether all of that is true or not, I'm not judging. I don't know the, all the details. But you can't set rules and then expect people to follow them but make exceptions all of the time. And I make the argument, and interestingly enough, I'm backed up on this by Ken Dye, who was the Auditor General. Uh, and he made a report in 1991, and I admit he and I worked on this together. <laughs> the pen behind the scenes. Um, Ken Dye made the report, and he, he did a comprehensive audit way back in, in the early 90s. And interestingly enough, the media now is saying the current Auditor General is doing a, uh, a, an audit, and this is the first time, it's not the first time, it was one in the early 90s. And Ken Dye made the recommendation that the Committee of Internal Economy should set the rules, make sure they're clear, and then back away. And let the administration, the clerk, the chief financial officer, whoever is handling it, implement the rules. And for you, Senator, and you, Senator, and you, Senator, you all follow the same rules. And there will not be an exception. And to me, that seems logical. It seems like, now that's not going to change a lot of the Senate, but it would change all of the scandal. And the scandals are really coming because of misinterpretation or different interpretations of the rules of what they're allowed to claim. Some of it's maybe <coughs> purposeful, that somebody is claiming something purposefully that they shouldn't. And perhaps a lot of it is just that they're making claims on a misinterpretation or a different interpretation of the rules. I don't think that making that change would require a constitutional change. And I think it would get rid of a lot of the scandal idea and would take the Senate out of that whole maelstrom of controversy that would perhaps help them restore its proper use. The Senate does do some good work. The Senate has some committees, and they have been able to produce some good work, but it's far overshadowed by all of the problems that the Senate has had, and most recently, uh, the most current ones. And so, as I said at the very beginning, we say that Senate reform is like talking about the weather. Everybody talks about it, and nobody does anything about it. The weather is changing, but I don't think the Senate is. Not for now. We'll just keep talking about it. Thank you very much.